Hey everyone, it's Marvin. This episode of Books and Boba is brought to you by Home Interrupted, a new podcast from our partners at Feet in Two Worlds. Climate change affects everyone, but it doesn't affect everyone equally. Immigrants often bear a unique burden due to climate change, but they're also leading the way with impactful solutions. Feet in Two Worlds, the news outlet and journalism training organization for immigrant voices, presents Home Interrupted. From flooded basement apartments in New York City to indigenous Maya farming practices in Nebraska, Feet in Two Worlds Home Interrupted brings you deeply reported original stories from across the United States. Episodes drop each week starting April 2nd. Find Feet in Two Worlds Home Interrupted wherever you listen to podcasts. Listening to Whoa. Potluck. Potluck. And hey, welcome to Books and Boba, a book club and podcast featuring books by Asian and Asian American authors. My name is Marvin Yue. And my co-host, Rira Yu, is on vacation. So today's mid-month book news check-in will be a solo episode for the first time. So uh, yeah, let's see how this goes. Um, as always, Books and Boba is supported in part by our listeners at patreon.com slash booksandboba. So if you are interested in becoming a bigger part of the Books and Boba podcast, um, head on over. Our Patreon supporters gain access to our members-only Discord server, where you can talk to fellow book club members in real time about all sorts of topics, including our ongoing going real-time discussion of this month's book club pick, Yellow Face by RF Kuang. And if you support us as a Honey Boba member, um, you get access to Boba Chats, which is our monthly bonus podcast. Um, and since we're doing some housekeeping, I um, just wanted to make a quick ask that if you are enjoying our podcast um, and you haven't done so already, please leave us a rating review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Ratings for better or worse still play a huge part in whether we get noticed um, on the Apple charts. And it's also nice to read your thoughts about our show and what we do. So if you do have the time to write something, it's greatly appreciated. But yeah, let's get into this mid-month check-in. As always, we start off by reviewing some of the latest Asian American publishing announcements collected from Publishers Weekly, Publishers Market, um, and other online sources. Um, Like I mentioned, since Rira is on vacation, this is the first time that I collected the stories on my own. So please let me know either on Goodreads or on our Discord if I missed anything that's on your radar. But yeah, our first publishing deal is Avon Books has acquired world rights to Adam and Evie's matchmaking tour by Nora Wynn, which is the nom de plume of Tao Tai, uh, the author of Banyan Moon, who we had on the podcast last year for an author chat uh, that you can find on Books and Boba episode 230. Adam and Evie's matchmaking tour is an enemies to lovers romance set in Vietnam in which the title characters keep getting thrown together, their animosity charged with attraction as they discover that true love may be out there. Publication is planned for fall 2024. So I know this is something that a lot of authors do when they um, dabble in different genres, which is in order to prevent, um, I guess, brand confusion, um, take on a pen name. Um, I'm assuming that Nora Wynn is Tao's alter ego when writing more, um, I guess, romancy books. But this premise does sound interesting. Always love a good enemies to lovers romance. A matchmaking tour sounds like it'll be a lot of fun. Um, probably a clash between modern and conservative Asian views on love. And I really enjoyed Banyan Moon, which was a Southern Gothic take on Vietnamese um, intergenerational trauma that had quite a bit of humor and heart in it as well. So really looking forward to learning more about Tao's new book. Um, if we ever do have her back on the show, I'd love to ask her about where the name Nora Wynn comes from. I know names can be a big part of um, our Asian American stories. Like for myself, both my name Marvin and my Chinese name Mei Hong are all part of my legal name. Uh, my Chinese name is my middle name. But I know plenty of people whose legal name is their Asian name and um, take on a Western name either for school or, you know, uh, for one year at Starbucks. Like my aunt um, doesn't have a Western name, but she uses the name Nancy for uh, reservations and for her Starbucks orders. So much that some of my cousins actually thought that her actual legal name was was Nancy. Uh, So yeah, I don't know. There's a story there. Would love to learn more. All right. Next up, Flatiron Books has acquired Yume Katase's Sisters at Sea, a story about two sisters who set sail on an epic quest to find their missing third sister who may hold the key to saving humanity a generation after the environmental collapse of Earth. 
Uh, this looks to be the third novel of Yume's, who specializes in writing speculative fiction following her debut novel, The Deep Sky, and her second novel, The Stardust Grail, which is coming out later this year in June. Uh, lots of interesting details in the description here, um, even though it's only one sentence long. Environmental collapse, meaning that this is a world after climate change has, you know, probably decimated um, civilization. And the fact that they set sail um, invokes maybe the world has become like a water world, which makes sense because if global warming continues, the sea levels will just keep rising. Right. So, you know, it's always cool to see um, authors takes on what life will be like if, you know, humanity continues to F things up. And I kind of do think we need more um, sci-fi that looks into what the world will be like after climate calamity, especially since it looks like we won't be, you know, heading out to space anytime soon. Um, and even with that, I'll probably only be like the really rich people, right? So chances are we'll, we'll be stuck here. Um, so we'll have to figure out how to how to make things work. Um, but yeah, Yume Katase, Sisters at Sea. Um, no publication date yet, but definitely one that I'm going to keep on my radar. All right, next up, Abrams Fanfare acquired a new graphic novel by Marco Tamaki and Nicole Gu called This Place Kills Me, about an aspiring actress who was found dead the morning after her high school performance as Shakespeare's Juliet, and the girl who was last to see her alive is determined to solve her murder. Um, yeah, sounds like this is a young adult uh, murder mystery. Uh, I am interested in what types of vibes this will take, right? Is this going to be like Ryan Johnson's Brick, where it's like a noir murder mystery played straight? Or is this more like a, you know, Scooby-Doo adventure, kids solving mysteries? Uh, lots of different forms that this can take. But I do like that the mystery is surrounding a high school play, which hopefully means we'll get plenty of drama kid energy in the story. Uh, the author, Mariko Tamaki, is a Canadian artist and writer, best known for a graphic novel Skim and This One Summer, and has written for projects for both Marvel and DC, including X-23, Spider-Man, She-Hulk, Supergirl, and Harley Quinn. And you know what? Um, us here at Books and Boba, we're always down for a good murder mystery. If we could help it, uh, we'd read murder mysteries all the time. Unfortunately, we tr do try to balance out our genre inclinations. But I think it's been a while since we last read a murder mystery. So our next pick might not be too far away. Uh, but yeah, congratulations to Marco Tomaki and Nicole Gu on the book deal. Looking forward to check out all the high school murder mystery goodness. And speaking of murder mystery goodness, our next book deal is another Murder Mystery, Quirk Books has acquired world rights in an exclusive submission to Kara Liu and Jennifer Young's Alice Chen's Reality Check, a rom-com murder mystery pitched for fans of Dial A for Aunties and One to Watch, about a reality TV show contestant who must fake date her rival to solve a murder on set. Publication for this book is set for summer 2025. Another super fun murder mystery setup involving a setting that invokes quite a bit of drama. And you know who you're talking to when you invoke um, Jesse Q. Sutanto's Dal A for Aunties. Um, don't really know what else to say about this besides love the setup, love the mashup between murder mystery and fake dating rom-com. Um, looking forward to all the hijinks, the red herrings, and the misunderstandings. Um, should be a lot of fun and looking forward to learning more about this next year. Uh, next up, moving away from murder mysteries, Little Brown has acquired world rights um, in an exclusive submission to Jim and Han's Dreamt I Found You. Pitched as a contemporary retelling of Korea's Romeo and Juliet story, The Tale of Cheongyang, in which the cousin of the star-crossed lovers helps them avoid a tragic fate. In a story steeped in Korean culture, the travails of a rigid class system, and the power of premonition, reincarnation, and overcoming generational trauma. So, so obviously I don't know much about the tale of Cheongyang. Um, I wonder if Rira would know some about that. But I always find it interesting, though, that, you know, Shakespeare's plays, uh, much like a lot of Western media, has become so ubiquitous, right? That we have to end up using them as shorthand to invoke the tropes of, like, star-crossed lovers um, fated to die at the end. Um, but those stories, you know, they're classics for a reason. And that's because you can find stories like that in any folktale tradition. Um, the story of two people falling in love from rival factions. It's a tale as old as time, right? And I'm always glad to see other versions of these stories being brought to the forefront. So congratulations to Jim and Han. Um, her debut novel, The Apology, is actually coming out this month, I believe. So definitely keep an eye out for that. Um, and I definitely like the title, A Small Revolution. Um, I think that says a lot when you're talking about a 
culture and system that's steeped in, you know, conservative class and gender roles. And there's a lot of really cool keywords here, right? Premonition, reincarnation, generational trauma, all things that I think um, those of us enjoyers of Asian pop culture, whether it's webtoons or dramas, have become familiar with, um, for better or worse. But yeah, congratulations to Jimin Han on her next book. All right, moving on. Penguin Press has acquired U.S. rights to Ocean Wong's next book, The Emperor of Gladness which follows a year in the life of a wayward young man in New England who by chance becomes the caretaker for an 82-year-old widow living with dementia, powering a story of friendship, loss, and how much we're willing to risk to claim one of life's most treasured mercies, a second chance. So listeners of the podcast should know that we did read um, Ocean Vong's debut novel, On Earth, We're Briefly Gorgeous, um, for book club, I think it was last year. And Ocean came up as a poet and essayist, so they definitely have a very beautiful poetic prose. Um, They're very good at painting word pictures. And I'm really looking forward to what they do with this story. I mean, it kind of reminds me, it gives me the vibes of stories like Tuesdays with Maury or um, the film Harold and Maude, where a young person ends up taking care of someone older and learning life lessons along the way. You know, these stories always have a bittersweet but usually hopeful ending. You know, it's about coming to terms with the temporal nature of life. And I'm definitely interested to see Ocean's take on on this type of story. Um, you know, as as I get older, I start thinking about this stuff a lot more, too. Um, you know, my parents are getting older. Um, I have friends who have had to deal with family members um, going through things like dementia, Alzheimer's, or just various health problems. It's not really like a feel good thing to think about, but there are things that we all have to go through, right? So having literature like this to help us process or you know organize those thoughts and feelings, in addition to providing an Asian American or Vietnamese American perspective, um, it's important. So looking forward to Ocean's new book, currently slated for publication in 2025. Uh, next up, Tor has acquired North American rights to Shirley Jackson Award winner and Astounding Award finalist Isabel J. Kim's debut novel, Sublimation. A literary speculative thriller set in a version of our world where instancing splits a person into two distinct copies when they cross a country's border, one who moves and one who remains. When a woman who left returns to Seoul and must face her other self, her childhood friend's New York self draws her into a conspiracy to control the future of instancing, bringing both versions of him back into her life with global repercussions. Now, this sounds like a really interesting um, concept. It sounds like to me an allegory for the act of immigration, right? Like the person who leaves the country and the person who comes back are two different people, right? Because you can't go to a new country, a new culture without leaving something behind and picking something up um, that changes who you are forever. Not unlike how, you know, the, the Asian cultures that we grew up in is also stuck in time, right? Like the Taiwanese culture that I grew up in. Uh, reflects Taiwan in the 70s and 80s as opposed to Taiwan today. And I think it's really fun when um, sci-fi authors explore concepts like this. Um, It definitely reminds me of the Apple TV sci-fi series Severance, where technology has allowed companies to separate people into their work selves and their not work selves, effectively partitioning the memories um, and what happens to the people stuck at at work all the time. Um, And speaking of Severance, Isabel's debut novel has already sold its TV adaptation rights to Universal International Studios, so there's a good chance we'll be seeing this story both on our screen and on the page as well. And I think that's pretty cool. The fact that instancing is such a huge um, core part of the story means that they'll have no choice but to hire actors who can be bilingual, who can play both a New York version and a Seoul version of themselves, which means casting from the diaspora, um, which I think, for better or worse, doesn't always happen in shows like this. So yeah, congratulations to Isabel for for all her deals, all the deals. Um, Looking forward to learning more about this book um, and hopefully the TV series soon. All right, next up, DAW has acquired North American rights to Pitch Wars alumna Roanne Lau's debut novel, The Serpent Called Mercy, a Malaysian-Chinese-inspired epic fantasy about a debt-ridden slumdog who joins an illegal monster-fighting arena for some fast coin but quickly learns the most dangerous beasts are outside the ring. Pitched as The Witcher meets Squid Game, which again are all keywords that I love. And you know who doesn't love a good 
Coliseum martial arts tournament story where the real villains are all the rich people watching up in the stands, right? Um, this sounds like a lot of fun. Um, you know me, always love a good Asian inspired fantasy, love a good underdog story. The logline Witcher meets Squid Game invokes probably a really cool bestiary in addition to uh, some class commentary in which I hope this ends in like some sort of revolution. That'd be great. Although the title is The Serpent Called Mercy, but mercy for whom? Uh, this book is part of a two book deal. Unsure if it's for a duology or two separate stories, but definitely something that I'm going to personally keep on my on my radar. Uh, so congrats to Roxanne on her deal. All right. Next up, Putnam has acquired world English rights to A Dark and Narrow House, the debut novel from World Fantasy Award winning Pakistani author Usman T. Malik, in which a group of young Pakistanis seek refuge from a global plague in a grand mansion on the Pakistani Indian border only to be haunted by the real and imagined ghosts of the region's violent past, pitched as Arabian Nights by way of Shirley Jackson. The novel is part of a three-book deal in addition to a story collection, Midnight Doorways, Fables from Pakistan, and a second novel. Again, much like the last novel, love a good speculative take on complex themes, this time a haunted house story about Indian and Pakistan's violent past. Not the type of book that I would normally read, although something to keep in mind because, you know, it, long-time listeners will know we often try to read a spooky book uh, for October. Rira and I are both not typically horror people, but I can be convinced when the allegory is good. Um, Shirley Jackson is the author of The Haunting of Hill House, uh, which is no classic haunted house literature. So definitely looking forward to Usman's own take on the genre, especially since these histories, they're not that old and they still very much haunt our present day um, in a lot of immigrant and refugee communities. So yeah, I'll always be into people tackling um, these themes and histories through genre fiction. I think it's a really cool way to tell these stories. All right. Um, next up, Ballantine has acquired world rights to 10 incarnations of Rebellion. Written by Vashnavi Patel, the story is set in an alternate historical version of India that was never liberated from the British. Following a young woman who forms a band of unlikely heroes to spark a revolution in her country. In an epic story of empowerment, friendship, self-determination, and the true meaning of freedom. Um, Vaishnavi Patel is also the author of Kaikei, which has been on our radar as a potential book club pick. As well as the upcoming novel, um, Goddess of the River, coming out next month. Both reimaginings of Indian Myths and folk tales. Um, so according to Vaishnavi's Instagram, this is actually a modern story uh, taking place in an alternate timeline where the British colonialism has continued up into the 1960s. Told as 10 moments from the main character's life that mirrored the Dasha Vatara, the 10 incarnations of Vishnu. So still following in her reimaginings of Indian legends and folklore. I love that this seems to be a story not just about the act of rebellion, but what causes someone to pick up the flag of rebellion and what it takes to stand up against colonial and imperialist powers. Um, all things that are, you know, sorely needed in today's world. All right. Next up, Crown has acquired North American rights to Saki Kawashiro's The Ex-Boyfriend's Favorite Recipe Funeral Committee in which a Tokyo cafe becomes a haven for the brokenhearted, where each week those who suffer cook their ex's favorite recipes, and in sharing the meal and their story, they are able to swallow their pain and move on. Uh, this definitely sounds like a Japanese um, novel, from its very descriptive title to its conceit of being a series of, I'm imagining, vignettes of different people um, coming to terms with the ends of their relationships through the cooking of food. So I'm definitely expecting some cozy vibes, um, some bittersweet stories, and plenty of food porn. Although part of me does wish that one of these exes has some really weird favorite foods. I, I think that'd be a cool way to shake things up a little. But yeah, we've always had a lot of fun reading stories like these. And it's cool to see a lot more of these cozy Japanese novels coming over to the States. And speaking of cozy Japanese novels, Putnam has acquired North American rights to Kiyoshi Shigematsu's The Blanket Cats, in which a peculiar Tokyo pet shop offers seven straggling customers a unique opportunity to adopt a cat, but only for three days. 
which is the time it'll take to alter the course of their lives forever. Uh, the novel was originally published back in 2008 and was the inspiration for a popular Japanese TV series back in 2017. Uh, Kiyoshi Shigematsu is one of the most prolific and best-selling authors in Japan, and this is his first novel um, to be brought over to the States. And again, another Japanese novel about a place of business that offers um, healing and therapy to its customers, this time by renting them kitties. Although the original book was written almost 25 years ago. So maybe this could be considered like one of the OG versions of this type of novel. But again, definitely cool to see more of these types of books come over to the States. I can definitely see a lot of my cat-loving friends enjoying this book. Um, I myself am more of a dog person, although my wife is a cat person. Um, although my mother-in-law hates small animals. So I don't think we're getting a, a pet anytime soon. Um but yeah, sounds like a lot of fun with some fluffy friends. Okay, our next book deal. Um, Atria has acquired Leverage by former Wall Street analyst Amran Gowani. Pitched as Black Book meets Showtime's Billions, in which a rising hedge fund star loses $300 million and his sense of self-worth in a single afternoon, then is blackmailed by his sadistic boss and given an impossible ultimatum. Recover the money in three months, or go to prison for insider trading. Publication is set for summer 2025. Now, I know a financial thriller isn't for everybody, but I, I kind of love this stuff. Um, I don't know if a lot of people know, but I I did go to business school and I do have you know an MBA. So, you know, my favorite type of true crime story is stuff like this, like financial crimes, financial thrillers um, about hedge funds and the way that financial systems and the stock market is mostly bullshit, but like high stakes bullshit. And, you know, one of the fears of stories like this is, are they going to lionize the um, institution of finance? And that's why I like that the the pitch um, includes Black Book, which is a satire about a salesman who works for a cult-like startup. So at the very least, I know that this is a book that seeks to satirize and skewer the industry, which is a stance that I can vibe with. And it's always cool to see these stories being told by people who used to be on the inside. So you know that there's some juicy firsthand experience in there as well. So yeah, congrats to Amran on the book deal. You know, I don't think we've read a financial thriller. You know, we've read plenty of workplace drama and rom-coms and definitely like corporate espionage thrillers, but not a story like this yet. So definitely another book to put on our radar as a future book club pick for sure, at least, at least for one of my picks. Okay, our next deal, Harlequin Heartwarming has acquired The Art of Love by Christy Hong, in which a woman starts a new job at a Mandarin immersion school where she finds not knowing the language to be challenging enough so she definitely should not fall for a fellow teacher who's moving back to Taiwan in just a few short months. A uh, publication is set for April 2025. So long-time listeners should know that I'm not the most familiar in the world of romance fiction, but even I have heard of Harlequin. Uh, so I think it's definitely cool that this long-running romance publishing giant is publishing romance novels starring Asian protagonists. And it looks like the Harlequin heartwarming imprint specializes in telling like Hallmark style, like heartwarming stories. Um, so i um, not sure about the smut factor here, but I do appreciate the simple setup of a woman who may or may not be grifting at the Mandarin speaking school who finds a presumably hot dude that she wants to get with. Um, will I read this book? Probably not, but I'm sure there's a lot of you who will, who will definitely love this. So um, yeah, congrats to Christy on her book deal with Harlequin. Um, next up, Ballantine has acquired North American rights to When Sleeping Women Wake by Emma Payen. Set during the Japanese occupation of Hong Kong during World War II, the novel follows the interconnected lives and fates of three extraordinary women, a mother, her daughter, and their maid, who end up playing pivotal roles in the resistance, pitched as inspired by real history. So again, a historical fiction novel set in the not-too-distant past. I mean, World War II was only a few generations ago. My, my, my grandparents lived through World War II, right? And for myself, at least, I'm not too familiar with uh, what happened in Hong Kong during Japanese occupation. Um, I have heard stories from my friends who told me about their grandparents' experiences. Um, they're not my stories to tell, but it definitely seems like a very harrowing experience. Um, you know, we famously know what happened in Nanjing during that time. And that definitely wasn't the only city that was under um, Japanese imperial occupation. 
And I do like the fact that the story follows three women um, and their roles in resisting the Japanese occupation. I think, you know, we forget sometimes that resistance and rebellion um, is not always fought by soldiers. And it'll be interesting to uh, read about the the different ways that people resist, especially because this is a story uh, about a mother, her daughter, and their maid, which to me signifies that there is also, in addition to a gender component, a class and privilege component too, uh, because this family is rich enough to have a maid, right? Uh, The book is slated to publish in summer of 2025 and has also been picked up worldwide in the UK, Australia, and Italy as well. So yeah, congrats to Emma on her debut novel. Um, And finally, our last book deal of this episode, Scribner has acquired North American rights to The Satisfaction Cafe by Kathy Wang. Um, The book is about finding joy and surviving loneliness at every stage of life, told through the story of a woman who experiences a series of surprising developments after she leaves Taiwan for California, her first marriage implodes, and she marries an older, wealthy man. Uh, This book definitely feels in line with, I think we recalled it, women's fiction. Uh, Definitely reminds me of Habitations, which we read earlier this month for our author chat with Sheila Sunder. And I always think it's cool to follow the many different types of stories immigrants have in this country. Asians and Asian Americans are not a monolith, and neither are our stories, the reasons we come to this country, the reasons we stay, and the happiness and challenges that we find are all unique based on our backgrounds, our experiences, where we land, where we go. And I think it's cool to read stories about the different ways people survive and find themselves, um, sometimes in spite of what is traditionally um, regarded as the path of happiness and the American dream. So yeah, congrats to Kathy and all of the authors featured in the segment on their book deals. All right, next up, we're moving into book news. Um, Don't have a lot going on. Rira is usually the one more in tune with the book tea, but we do have a couple stories um, that popped up that are interesting to take a look at. Um, First of all, just a quick announcement that Rira and I will be returning to um, the Festival of Asian Books taking place at the Michelle Obama Library in Long Beach on Saturday, uh, May the 4th. So if you're in the L.A. area, uh, please head on over, say hi to us. Um, We'll have stickers and bookmarks that you can pick up and it'll be great to see you guys in person. It's always wild, but but fulfilling to see um, our listeners in IRL. The Festival of Asian Books is put on by Bell Cantle Books, uh, which is an Asian-owned uh, bookstore out in Long Beach. And we appreciate them reaching out to us um, to be a part of their festival again. Um, there's some really cool speakers and authors that will be on site for uh, panels and signings, um, including Carolyn Wynn, the author of The Fortunes of Jaded Women, which was one of our book club picks last year, um, as well as Viet Thanh Nguyen, the author of The Sympathizer. Uh, for more information, you can go to the Belcanto Books website at belcantobooks.net. Um, I'll drop a link down in the show notes for you to check out. And speaking of Viet Thanh Nguyen, the TV adaptation of his debut novel, The Sympathizer, uh, just started broadcasting on HBO, uh, starring Huang Shunde, Robert Downey Jr., and Sandra Oh. It is a weekly series that is on a broadcast schedule, so only two episodes are out as of today. And I've been hearing good things about it. I myself have not started a series yet, um, but it's definitely on my to-watch list. I'm currently watching Fallout. Um, I have a couple episodes left to go, and that's been great. Um, But really looking forward to how they adapt The Sympathizer. It's definitely a series that I am curious to what they do, especially towards the end of the book, when it starts to change up the style of the prose. I'm really curious on how they portray that on on the screen. Uh, So yeah, we'll probably discuss our thoughts about The Sympathizer on a future Boba Chat, um, and definitely um, on my other podcast, Good Pop. Uh, We'll definitely talk about the series um, later on in this run as well. And for our last story for this episode, um, the story broke earlier this week, but Crazy Rich Asians uh, by Kevin Kwan is now being developed as a musical with John M. Chu, the director of the film, set to direct. Uh, The musical is being developed by Warner Brothers Theater Ventures and Kevin Kwan and features a book by playwright Leah Nautical Winkler with music by Helen Park and lyrics by Amanda Green and Tat Tong. Uh, The production is aiming for a Broadway engagement with a pre-Broadway run to be announced shortly. Uh, this story is quite interesting, and I really wish I can get Rira's um, thoughts about the story. I'm sure we'll talk about it at some Boba Chat in the future. Um, I think Crazy Rich Asians is an interesting 
title to adapt in this way. And it really does feel like there's been this like Broadway and Hollywood eating its own tail thing going on in recent memory. Um, the Mean Girls musical movie comes to mind, which is a movie adaptation of a musical adaptation of a film. John M. Chu, of course, in addition to directing Crazy Rich Asians, also directed the film adaptation of In the Heights, as well as the upcoming two-part adaptation of Wicked. So, so the man definitely has, like, ins in Broadway, right? According to The Hollywood Reporter, both the film and original book trilogy by Kevin Kwan provide the basis for the stage adaptation. So I guess there's a chance that elements from the sequel might be pulled into the musical as well. Although that's, that's a lot. That's like three books to cover. And, you know, musicals are long, but they're not that long, right? Um, the team is interesting, too. So in addition to John Chu, the playwright is Leah Nautical Winkler, who I've actually seen a couple of her plays, Two Mile Hollow and Kentucky, and I really do enjoy her style. She has very snappy dialogue that I think fits well with the vibes of A Crazy Rich Asians. Um, she definitely has a satirical take, which I think is, is necessary for a production like this. Um, I will say I kind of wish we had a Chinese-American um, voice adapting this for the stage, but surprisingly, I'm not. I'm not mad about it. Um, I really do enjoy Leah's place, so I'm hoping she'll do a good job with this. Um, I do wonder how much um, of the book and how much of the film is being adapted. Because for those of you who listened to our discussion of Crazy Rich Asians, um, you'll know that I wasn't the biggest fan of the book, um, but I loved the movie. I think the film, and specifically Adele Lim, um, one of the co-screenwriters, did a lot of work to um, smooth out the rough edges of the original text and add a lot more you know, heart and, and pathos um, to, to the story. So I'm hoping the musical... Um, takes more from that aspect and we don't get like you know songs that teach us about the difference between like a Birkin and the Kelly right and I am excited that the music is going to be by Helen Park um, who also did the music to the short-lived k-pop musical on Broadway a production that I'm sad I didn't get a chance to see because they asked it after a month um, so hopefully this will be this will be her redemption uh, but yeah, I'm curious to hear what you all think about this news. Please let us know on Goodreads or on Discord if you're there. I'm not exactly sure I want this, but I'll definitely be watching it if I get the chance. Because unfortunately, there still aren't that many musicals out there starring or telling Asian stories besides like the super oriental ones like The King and I and Miss Saigon. And while a Crazy Rich Asians musical has the potential to be just as oriental um i think i trust the people behind the scenes to not let that happen so yeah we'll keep an eye out on this story as it develops as well i'm sure most of the asian american entertainment community and we'll definitely keep you all updated once they get into casting and hopefully previews uh, but with that, that'll do it for our mid-month check-in episode for April 2024. Thank you so much. If you've listened to this point, thank you so much for hanging with me. Um, I'm not sure how this is all going to work. Um, if you have any feedback for this solo episode, um, please let me know on Discord or Goodreads. Uh, feedback is always appreciated, just in case I have to do this again in the future. Um, but before we go, a quick reminder that our book club pick for April 2024 is Yellow Face by R.F. Kuang, a story about a white author who steals the manuscript of her recently deceased um, Chinese best friend, quote unquote best friend, which allows her to become the best selling author she always dreamed herself to be. And all she had to do was do a little identity theft and maybe put on some yellow face. Um, it is a wild book. I'm almost halfway through it at the time of this recording. And we've been having a great conversation about the book over on Discord for those of you who are Patreon subscribers. So um, definitely having a lot of fun reading along with you all and really excited for a discussion at the end of the month. I'm sure we'll have plenty to say about this book. But with that, thanks for tuning in. It was fun to go over the book news with you all. And I'll see you all next time on Books and Boba. Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening to Books and Boba. This podcast was hosted by Marvin Yue and Ri Rayu and edited and produced by Marvin Yue. Follow the book club on Twitter and Instagram by going to at Books and Boba and engage with us on Goodreads on our Goodreads group. You can also check out past episodes of the podcast by going to booksandboba.com and by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast app. Don't forget, you can support Books and Boba and Asian American authors by purchasing books at our bookshop.org account. Check out the link in our show notes and also at booksandboba.com. Books and Boba is a proud member of the Potluck Podcast Collective, a collective of Asian American hosted podcasts featuring unique voices and stories from the Asian diaspora. Learn more about the collective and check out our fellow Potluck shows by visiting the website podcastpotluck.com. Thanks for listening.
Hey, Brian. Did you go to Saturday school as a kid? I sure did. Did you? Totally. Well, at our podcast, Saturday School, we don't teach a language, but we pass along the culture that we do know. And that's Asian American pop culture. Ada is a journalist, and I'm a professor and film festival programmer. We've watched a lot of great Asian American movies, and we want you to watch them too. Come listen to us as we look back at the pioneering films that have led us to today. 